And good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Harvard uh, Law School. Uh, my name is Charles Ogletree. I'm the Jesse Kalminko Professor of Law uh, and the founder and the executive director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. I have to tell you uh, that we are very pleased uh, today and tonight for what we're able to do. Uh, one of the things that we have always done is to sponsor events, films, uh, discussions, uh, conversations with people about a whole host of issues. Uh, and this is uh, like it, uh, it's even better. Uh, I, I have to leave, but I have to say this for those who are wondering. I'm in the film, so you know I'm very interested in the film. Uh, it makes all the difference. A great, great film, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, and uh, uh, this team uh, has done a great job of putting together uh, a piece uh, on uh, you know, hate uh, in, in these great lands, and people are amazed by it. And I think the balance of what we talked about in Tulsa uh, when we filed a lawsuit in 2003 um, is important. Uh, and as I uh, shared with Rachel, what makes it so amazing is that all these clients we represented, th these are people who were victims in the 1921 uh, Tulsa race riot, African Americans. And, and they were 90, degree, 90 years old and older when we met them uh, in 2003. Uh, and the sad news is uh, by 2013, a year ago, uh, virtually every single one uh, had died. Uh, and, and that was amazing uh, to, to have to go through that. Uh, and what uh, Rachel and uh, Pi Isis have done is put together this wonderful film that, uh, in a sense, pulls these two acts together, what happens in America. And you think about what happened in 1921, and imagine the same thing happening uh, a decade later, and that's exactly what we were able uh, to see. So let me introduce them and say uh, that, I, that, that I hope that you'll enjoy the film. It's uh, a little under an hour, uh, and they will just talk for a few minutes just to introduce it and to make sure that you can uh, appreciate it. And I hope you'll watch all of it, and I hope that you also will ask that uh, uh, they will bring this film to your school, your church, your community, because that's what they're trying to do, to make sure that they are able to be seen uh, and talk about this work around the country. Uh, Rachel Lyon, who was to my far uh, left, uh, literally and figuratively, uh, a very <laughs> progressive uh, writer, director, and producer, uh, she's an Emmy, Emmy Award-winning documentary filmmaker and has produced 60 five uh, feature films, uh, movies uh, for television, uh, feature documentaries, and limited uh, series as well. And uh, her work is amazing. It often focuses on critical global issues, human rights, uh, civil e equality, art, uh, and uh, art, 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 archaeology, uh, lifestyle, and, and history. Uh, she's also a professor uh, and artist in residence at North Kentucky University. She practiced here for a long time and taught here uh, in Massachusetts. Her breath, uh, breakthrough work on exposing the crime media business involves a partnership between uh, 10 universities around the country, culminating in a major sy symposium on media and human rights in America in her new film, Hate Crimes in the Heartland. Uh, Pi Isis, uh, and how do I press the last name? Ankara. Ankara is the co-producer. Uh, and she's had 16 years of experience uh, doing uh, philanthropic industry, developing uh, strat strategic initiatives uh, targeted at uh, leveraging private and public uh, investments. And uh, she has uh, secured over $150 million to support uh, the sustainability and uh, capacity building efforts of community-based organizations. Uh, specifically uh, those who are involved in the field of social uh, justice and advocacy. Uh, in, in the past five years, uh, she's broadened her prof professional uh, uh, offerings to include uh, media development, work on both short and long form uh, content projects, and as a film, television, and live event uh, producer, uh, she has focused her work on the design and delivery of strategic plans to reach and engage targeted audiences around uh, stories that surface when you talk about social and cultural issues, uh, and often on, uh, talking about underrepresented uh, people who are not represented in mainstream media. 
She's also uh, worked in partnership with a multitude of institutions, including the Ford Foundation, the Democratic National Committee, the NAACP, and others on planning, fundraising, and event uh, production uh, to highlight and promote uh, social uh, justice issues. And just recently, she partnered with uh, Rachel in, in this important work uh, to pr uh, put out uh, the hate crimes in the heartland. Uh, and she is responsible for the overall planning of the marketing approach, fundraising, and network development uh, of this uh, hate with, uh, crimes in the heartland uh, and hope that you will be supportive. And so uh, I hope you'll enjoy what they have to say about the film, enjoy the film. And I hope that before you leave, uh, you will also write some hefty checks. Uh, they would love to receive them because I think the, the reality is that we only have great uh, media like this, presented in places like this, when people make it uh, their lifetime mission to uh, support what we're trying to do. I also want to introduce uh, David Harris, who is here somewhere. David is the, uh, uh, where is he at? Uh, he, he, he disappears at moments like this, but uh, uh, David has been uh, with me uh, off and on. He's worked first with the uh, Fair Housing Office in uh, Greater Boston, uh, creating uh, homes and opportunities for families and spoke in my class is. today. There he is. Uh, and he also uh, is the managing director of the uh, Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice and has done a, a really incredible job. And, and he loves arts, uh, and so uh, he's a, a great artist himself, a painter, designer, and uh, loves uh, what he's able to do. He's done a big job for us. Uh, and so I hope that you'll enjoy this film, but more importantly, understand uh, the individuals who sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears to in, captivate uh, all of you with this great uh, film and with a story about Tulsa uh, and beyond Tulsa as well. So please uh, welcome our guests, and we'll look forward to hearing you soon. Thank you. We will talk with you more like after the film, um, but well, we certainly oh. hope that you enjoy the work and uh, appreciate uh, Tree. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll see you. And um, David, uh, thank you very much for inviting us here, and we're, we're thrilled to present it to you here at Harvard and to have the uh, cornerstone, really cornerstone partner of our project uh, be presenting this tonight. Thank you for having us. I'd, I'd like for us to have a discussion after the film um, to receive some of your reactions. One of the goals for um, going around to these seven cities during Black History Month is to open the forum to get your reactions because we realize that when it comes to the issue of race, we all come to it from a different perspective. So we'd like to hear back from you to help us develop a roadmap towards reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I don't, I don't think I want to monopolize. I think we want to have the opportunity for the audience to, to, to talk to us a bit. But uh, I, I would like to ask you all kind of uh, what, what you see as the, the theme of the film and what, what you really see as uh, I mean, it's a powerful and emotional experience for those of us who haven't seen it to, to kind of go through this journey. I'm sure we all come out of it with a certain set of emotions. Um, but I suspect for you all also making it a film was an emotional experience. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit about what it's like to go through the process of putting something like this together. Where do you come out? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, David, and, and uh, certainly to the um, Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice here at the Harvard Law School, to my co-producer. Um, but it is, it is great uh, for you guys to be here tonight. Um, I think that when, uh, when Charles Ogletree, when Tree first started telling me a little bit about Tulsa in 1921, I was kind of, okay, that is a pretty amazing story and kind of get on with my life. But when I heard about these Good Friday murders, I literally, like, I know it's a very, you know, hip term now, I leaned forward. I literally leaned forward and said, oh my God, this is a film. Because there's a link now with the past and the present. And that link, um, you know, kind of forced me up out of my seat. And I, I started, 
you know, jumping around and, and calling you. Within days, within weeks, we were in Tulsa. And um, it's hard to imagine having a stain like that in your home and, and how to deal with that. And I think uh, getting to know the people of Tulsa and how they, they um, go through this, um, this past that's always there, hovering over their shoulder, it has been a real awakening for me. Uh, what Rachel won't tell you is that um, the film was made by people who were just committed to telling the story. And it was really uh, Rachel's vision to bring together the resources of Northern Kentucky University. So normally for a documentary, as you all know, you have to raise the money. And we had a hard time finding partnerships. And so it really came down to people who believed that the story had to be told and would take time out of their normal lives, their day-to-day -day jobs, to go to Tulsa to help make this come to fruition. So I think that that's very important to say. And as we started to talk to different people and, and present the film, and I, and I want you to talk a little bit about Tulsa's reaction last week, which was our first premiere, um, the film's about race. And at the end of the day, in 2014, just as it was in 1921, people will lose their lives, their dignity, or their youth because they are a person of color. And it's not acceptable. Um, it's something that we have to come together as a country to change. And the only way we can do that is if we face it and we become accountable for all of it um, from then and for now. So you know, we should absolutely talk a little bit about the process and of making the film and presenting the film. But you know, we definitely want to hear from all of you because that's what this is about, to hear what your reactions are and um, how you can help us move forward towards some type of healing and coming together as a community. So I, I do want us to open it up. But the, the other thing I, I do want to kind of think about a little bit is, <clears throat> as you said, Professor Oltree, and you can see in the film, Professor Oltree has been working on this for quite a while. And uh, the case of the survivors is uh, very important to him. And uh, when uh, Wes Young died recently, it really took a toll on him. And, uh, I, I think one of the things that I get from the film, I'll take the prerogative here, is to, to say that you really get a sense of the people of Tulsa being the survivors. Right? There's a sense of some people in Tulsa who have that history, who live that history, and who long for the kind of reconciliation uh, that Bishop Tutu talks about. Uh, and the, the actual uh, survivors may be gone, but the need for that, in a way, might be even more intense for those who are left behind. You talk a little bit about how the people of Tulsa themselves uh, experience this memory. I think um, when there's a trigger, and, and I, I think we all have that situation. We had it with 9-11. We, we've had it in, in times more recent. We had it with the Trayvon Martin case. You know, everybody becomes kind of reacts with this, um, with this history riding them. And um, the fact that Tulsa did a better job this time, uh, I felt that as we were screening it in Tulsa, and it was a packed house, there were uh, people from, from a lot of different communities there, including the chief of police and the, uh, the head of what, what's the, the uh, paper of record there, the Tulsa World, and they were kind of going at it, you know, why didn't you call it a hate crime? And you know, why did you push us to call it a hate crime? When we had a murder, we, we, we needed to go after that murder. And one of the things that's interesting about Tulsa and Oklahoma is a hate crime is a misdemeanor. It's a misdemeanor. It is a slap on the wrist. So yeah, I can get why the chief of police wasn't going after these, hate, these as hate crimes. But what are we gonna do then in our country? What are we gonna do to get hate crimes thought of more seriously, taken more seriously over, over time? Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting at the New York panel, Michaela Angela Davis, who's also on CNN, on uh, Anderson Cooper's 360 um, television show, she talked a little bit, about, and we wanted to bring her in just part of the media's response and responsibility. She talked a little bit about the 12 years of slave and going to see that film with her daughter her daughter's a teenager. 
her daughter, the first response that her daughter had was, why did I read the diary of Anne Frank and not this narrative? And so what we're finding in conversation, uh, people have different reactions. Some are angry, some are uh, saddened, some are confused. Um, others are just completely educated because they didn't actually know that Black Wall Street existed or that the Tulsa race riots happened. And so if we put it in context, what we're thinking about is if you go to a public school here in America and you look at African American history, oftentimes in our textbooks, it starts with slavery and there's this marker at MLK, right, with Martin Luther King and civil rights movement, but what happened in between and what happened before and what's happening now? So some people have actually come back to us and said, we need a curriculum or we need to fill in the gaps. This, this film is so important that everyone needs to see it for the simple fact of, yes, to move towards reconciliation, but just to simply educate each other about our true history. So again, I think we all are interested in hearing from you all, and I, 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 I'm kind of in, I'm tempted to open it up to, to questions and comments from the floor. If you'd use the microphones and come on up and uh, keep your questions as questions, as Professor Ogletree would say. Hi there. I'm, I'm Toby Knudsen. Love, loved your film. Thank you for bringing this uh, subject matter to light. It, the, the root cause of the, the situation in the, in the elevator uh, Reminds me, uh, let's see, of um, what was it, another city, uh, someone whistling at a white white woman, the, the, right, right, and uh, also uh, this Salem uh, uh, witch trials. Uh, uh, really, root cause came down to two two girls uh, talking about uh, someone signing the devil's book. Mm -hmm. have, have you uh, drawn any comparisons to these? Did, did either of these? Uh, well, especially the Salem witch uh, event. Did, did uh, the root cause of these, uh, you find any parallels? Well, that one hasn't come up yet, <laughs> the Salem witch. <laughs> but what's interesting is we have a partner, a local partner coming to the table. That's a really interesting organization if you're interested in it. Um, they, they bring together uh, black and white people to just talk about race, which is a very difficult thing for us to do in smaller groups. Um, but what's interesting is when we first started to talk to them, one of the first statements they made was there were 25 race riots in this country in 1919, most people don't know about. So I think that when, you know, when Rachel said she leaned forward, it's bec and, and really speaking to these reactions and the triggers, it's because we have this undercurrent of rage almost and fear. And the problem is, is that when we are unaware of our history, we don't have an understanding of why we feel certain ways about each other and the prejudices. But then when we're in positions of power, that becomes very dangerous. And positions of power mean folks who actually are judges and juries, people who own guns. Um, so we have to become a little bit more responsible to our history and then also to our behavior today. Um, I just have some questions about the situation in Tulsa in terms of racial profiling, in terms of what Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow, in other words, what is it like there, you know, both before and after these Good Friday killings? Um, Tulsa is not unsimilar to really all of, of our cities. Um, there, uh, the, the city, and, and in, in particular, I'm going to come back to this point about the media. Um, I kind of came up, especially, you know, in my first, I'm not even going to say how many films, thinking we are the good guys, the media. We shine the light. We are it. We, we show the bad things that are happening and make things get better. And it wasn't until and actually working with this institute and with Tree the last time on a film about race and the death penalty that I found out kind of by, by mistake that the media was the bad guy in two cases. In, and all of a sudden, I kind of turned the cameras around and started looking at the role of the media in what I would call our crime media business, a business that is now a $4 billion a year business, a business you can put the crosshairs at the OJ trial and keep on going um, with what, uh, what gets put into everybody's minds. 
And so coming to your question, I think this notion that we have these um, kind of renegade black male bad guys that are out there committing crimes, that we have to build more prisons and bust more people and all that, that's going on in Tulsa, it's going on in Chicago. I'd be very surprised if it's not going on here in Boston. It's going on in our cities. And it's kind of, you know, the prison system going broke that's beginning to stop, beginning to stop the, the incarceration. There's a lot of things that are that beginning to stop the over incarceration, but, but it's, it's one of the things. So I have one comment first and then a question. Um, so I, I don't know if you're familiar at all with the Facing History in Ourselves curriculum that's used in a lot of schools across the country. Um, they certainly first started with the Holocaust, but they've done a lot of work on how people make choices um, throughout history. And, and I think that this is a kind of film that could be very well integrated um, with some of the curriculum they have and they'd be a good resource. Uh, but secondly, um, this story is sort of told through the notion, I think, that, you know, so we've got these two people who did this horrific thing in 2012. And so to what extent are there groups, hate groups in, um, in Tulsa or that you looked at that may either have perpetuated or been involved or were these uh, two people at all involved with a group of people or are they just, are we looking at this through the lens of just, you know, individuals versus, I think, groups of people who promote hate uh, across the country? I think there, there really are uh, groups of people that promote hate. I think that the group that these two guys really are a part of is the, uh, the socioeconomically depressed white guys who end up, in general, being the guys who commit these crimes. They committed them in 1921, and as individuals, in this case, um, in, an, an individual who was obsessed with this black man who shot his dad uh, and killed him and was obsessed about all of that, um, and he lashed out. I think that the lashing out, that you know, getting to the person that's one rung lower on the economic, you know, edge than you are is something that we see, unfortunately, we see a lot of. So it doesn't take a hate group, even though there are hate groups. And again, one thing that's happened is the media and this kind of, you know, what I would call hate radio, I mean, in particular, uh, some of the stuff that you hear, you kind of go, is that directly inciting people to go and, you know, pick up their guns and go start shooting? Or is it just my imagination that it sounds like that. I think in addition to the, the villainization of, of African Americans, specifically black males in the media, we've also created a sense of uh, worth that people of color are less than. We perpetuated that in many of our systems. And what's interesting, some of the takeaways from looking at the identity of, of the villains, if you will, of 2012, one with a half-brother who's black, the other whose ethnicity is actually Native American. They both associated though that they were white and they were going against black people. I think we have to understand that we're, in terms of identity, there's so many dimensions. Even if you look at the reporter, the black woman, you would imagine that she would speak from the perspective of her race. But what she said was, this was the best week on television. She's speaking from the perspective of her position and her, her job. So I think at, at first glance, we make assumptions about who the villains are and who the victims are. Um, but we have to take a step back and really understand the context and the system that we're living in, too. So Rachel, let me ask, ask you a different question that kind of goes back to work we've done before. Uh, there, there are a couple of things about this that are actually very interesting and the kind of the, the fact that this was a death penalty case, right? Uh, as, as you know, I mean, the kind of interesting part of the questions here is that, uh, as we know, that usually the greatest predictor of whether we have a death penalty is if there's a white victim. So this question of what started the Tulsa race riot and all this other stuff really grows out of a, a, a pattern or history we have in this country about things that happen to whites and uh, whether we have the death penalty. 
but we also have in this, we're reminded of uh, uh, the, the, the family, the bird family, right? Uh, actually making pleas for, uh, uh, to, 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 to spare uh, the people who did these terrible things to Matthew, to, from uh, the death penalty, kind of speaking out against it. Um, and I'm curious, when we did the work before, we thought about what was the role of, the so, of social media in terms of uh, promoting uh, opposition. Can you talk a little bit about the extent to which the social media played a role in kind of making this case better known? I mean, we know that it's, it's fascinating that you show his Facebook entry, right? So what about the social media on the other side in terms of helping the community organize, mobilize, and get the word out? I think, well, you want to address it, Rachel? Well, the social media, the traditional and social media in 2012 helped to solve the crime. So there is an arc, there is an incredible story here, and, and I don't want to be too dark or too heavy handed on the media, a lot of it is positive. Uh, there's a lot of good news out there, there is some freedom of expression that we didn't have, we certainly wouldn't have uh, if we didn't have the social media. 90% uh, of traditional media is owned by 10 companies, so it's pretty corporate. Um, whereas we have a, a, a big wide range of freedoms in, in social media. And, um, and it's amazing that people will use their social media as if people aren't gonna see that. They're gonna say effing N-word on their Facebook and say I'm about to go off and assume that's not gonna be seen. You gotta be kidding me. Who, who talked to them about privacy? You know, So it is pretty interesting. Um, and there are, a, there's a lot going on with our social media. We're working with the film now, which we would love to connect with um, Facing History and, and other people. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting about social media is that it's, especially a younger generation, uh, what we're finding is that the, the children of the, of, of the generation of the civil rights movement are actually activists online. That's where they give their voice. That's what they've become accustomed to, right? Uh, and there's no barrier geographically for their reach. So for example, we started three weeks ago on social media, on various platforms, Twitter, on Facebook, on Tumblr, just to engage as many people as possible to create a, a better awareness around these issues of, of hate crimes. And we started with 20 imprints, meaning that 20 people knew who we were. And yesterday we got to 400,000. I can't do that with pamphlets. Right, so that means that well, you have an opportunity, again, no geographic barrier, we can go international. There's a possibility to really connect with people who are like-minded, who really wanna see an end and maybe even move towards reconciliation in some way. And they see the ties with South Africa, with Tulsa, and from New York to here. Um, so there's a power there, but there's also a responsibility. And so what we found when we started to look at this story, we were first thinking, oh, we're gonna look at the media's responsibility then and now. And the only way you can look at the media's responsibility now is if you understand that we are all citizen journalists because we all have the responsibility in our hands. So then that's your power. And if you choose to say nothing, isn't it actually the same as doing nothing, right? You're actually on the other side. So I would encourage everyone to participate on our platforms and to engage in the conversation our um, website is Hate Crimes Heartland, and we're on Facebook, and we're also on Twitter. Did you have another question? Hello. Um, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you um, for the film. I have um, two questions. Um, the first one is um, if you could explain just the journey of um, doing a film like this, because um, I'm a film student myself, and you know, I'm interested in documentaries and just seeing how you put everything together. If, you know, you could just like give a um, few pointers like or like m what you must do, what you feel like. I wish someone just told me like going through this experience, putting the film together. And um, the second question is, I know we talk about like segregation and um, in our communities and I was wondering, how do you feel about like segregation and information? Because we live in a 
time where like I watch um, I I I watch my own special network of things and um, in Pandora I listen to my own music um, in the internet I, I go to a specific site mm -hmm. I don't you know I, I you know like people will watch Fox News or people will only watch CNN and just if you could give like your opinion, like how do you feel about like um, segregation of information? Thank you. Well, just a couple tiny things about making a film. I, I, when I made my first film, I went to every great filmmaker that I was curious about and asked them how they got their first film made, and they all said something different. But Scorsese, when we did get to him, said, lie, steal, cheat, shoot, 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 <laughs> shoot, shoot, shoot. So I, I guess I, I really want to say if you, if you care about a subject, particularly if you're doing nonfiction, you've got to begin to gather that footage and have something that you can show. Go get something that you can edit because then you can come back, then you can raise money, then you can get back into the editing room. There's more tools now for a filmmaker than there ever have been. And there's a harder road to hope because a lot of people, whether or not it's you, um, think, well, my, my 13 year old is making films. It's, <laughs> it's not hard to make films. It's actually very hard to make a film as yes. I'm sure you're beginning to realize or more than beginning to realize as a student. Um, why don't you hit the other question? Well, I, I also want to say about being a filmmaker is that it's, um, it's important to be with someone who knows the ropes, right? So I have my 65 filmmaker <laughs> films here, which is fantastic. Um, you have to believe in your story because there will be times when you won't have anyone else who believes in it but you. And once you then have your product, your project, you have to identify how it resonates with different audiences, right? So there are a lot of stories in this film, and it just depends on the perspective, and it's just a matter of understanding how it will resonate and being able to communicate and engage with your audience ongoing so that it will actually have an impact. Um, the other question that she had was this, the silos of, of um, how we, we have appointment television, everything is very much based on our choices, right? And so, but I think that comes back to the multi-dimensions of who we are, right? So you may like a certain four stations on Pandora, but you'll have something else in common with, with someone who thinks the other seven are very different. So I think, you know, we, we're more the same than we are different. And I think it's just a matter of finding those similarities. I think that the segmentation in media is one of the things I'm kind of pointing to in terms of my concerns about the media. So we have, we have news that only leans, or almost only leans, to the right. Or some, not as much, that only leans kind of to the left. And people are flocking there and listening to stuff they already agree with. And that, that is a real change. That is a, you know, that's not, you know, and this is the story, you know, tonight, you know, definitively, and everybody gets that same story. We are getting different stories, and we are um, nurturing different narratives inside. And so that segmentation is, is deeply affecting us. It's one of the reasons why hate crimes have doubled in the last 10 years, or nearly doubled. Um, because people are listening to very different things. They're seeing, and you know, just pulling it as an example, it's not the only one, but they're seeing the Trayvon Martin case in completely different ways. You have people absolutely seeing two different cases having happened, uh, or 200 different cases having happened. And uh, you know, was it fair? You know, we could get into it right here and now. Uh, and probably everybody would have little disagreements at least with each other about that. That is partially due to what we're ingesting in the media. So. I just, I wanted to ask a question of the audience. I just wanted to get a sense from all of you. How many of you actually knew about the Tulsa race riots? Wow. That's why they're here. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're here. <laughs> <laughs> And do you have any thoughts on how we move beyond the film? Is it in terms of the call to action? 
Is it a curriculum that we should incorporate into high schools and colleges? Is it a petition to go to Congress to ask for reparations for this community or for others? Um, maybe justice? I just wanted to throw that out there just so we can get a sense. Well, wait, Ernest, let this guy. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'll have one thing and we have one more last question. I'll say in regards to strategy, perhaps utilizing the youth voice, mm -hmm. which is normally uh, diminished when it comes to conversation of how to make change. Then you see youth make change, and you're like, how did that happen? It's because the kids just go online and start talking. So I think the typical route is to let's make a petition, let's talk to politicians. I wouldn't do that. Go to the kids, go to the 18 to 35, go to the college students that are working on these things that are possibly uh, working on projects that could be connected um, or working on projects that are you know, about discrimination or hate and are trying to spread love, hope, and other you know, good attributes. So I think starting with social media as you already are doing and maybe connecting with the youth and see if the youth can create a new voice. Hi, thank you for uh, bringing the movie here. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, especially like how this movie is being a vehicle for um, bringing forward a conversation about uh, race reconciliation. A lot of people did speak about that uh, from different perspectives. Um, it was also interesting to see one of the signs, uh, one of the pictures that you had uh, when there were some protests going on against integration. There was a big sign which said, integration is communist or something like that. Um, uh, so I wanna ask you uh, something about race and class. And um, Theodore Allen has a book which is called Invention of the White Race, uh, volume two, the origins of uh, uh, white skin supremacy in the US or something like that. So he traced, his uh, idea is that, you know, when the first people came from Europe to uh, America, in the 1600s, they were also working side by side. There were a lot of uh, poor people working side by side with uh, slaves brought over from, they were all bonded laborers. And then there was actually a situation in, in 1670 when um, the, both, all the bond, all the slaves who were both uh, you know, from Africa and Europe, they banded together and they participated in uh, Bacon's Rebellion. And that sort of triggered, so Theodore Allen claims that that triggered this invention of the white race where uh, all the uh, people from Europe were freed and, and then only that was the beginning of giving special privileges to so-called white. And that's before you know, people were like either Irish or you know, they were called different things, but there was no like white concept, even historical records. It came into being only after like 70 years of these people being and after Bacon's rebellion. And he extends that thesis um, saying that systematically uh, these white people were given extra privileges and they sort of, and this white, that led to the privilege, white skin privileges, and which um, led to a sort of a class collaborationism between the so-called whites and the owners or ruling class. Or, and what, another example of that is um, before World War II, uh, the unemployment rate between uh, was somewhat equal between blacks and whites, but after the New Deal, after 20 years or 30 years of the New Deal, it doubled the difference. The white and black unemployment was 13%, and it still remains. And um, and even privileges that you mentioned, like in media, how people's uh, certain people who look like a certain way get privileged in Hollywood or on TV, and they're represented a certain way. So in thinking about these and in the context of how do we improve race relations and how, what are the instances where people have worked together? Um, you know, you can recall like Fred Hampton and his uh, Rainbow Coalition. And that poster about integration is communist. You know, it, it shows that the other instances of race collaboration was when class was explicitly brought into the picture and you know there was a lot of integration in the communists in say 40s or 50s. I'm coming to the question. I'm sorry. Um, so, <laughs> so my question is: so, 
So Theodore Allen asked this question, even in the left, is it possible you have to first think about white skin privilege before you can work in, on the left? But at the same point, when you're trying to do race relations, is it possible to talk about how future race relations are going to be harmonized without talking about class? Is Jesse Jackson going to do it, or is uh, Mr. Obama going to do it? And how, how can we, so that's the question. Is it possible to talk about uh, race relations without talking uh, first about class? I think that there is a behavior and a culture that we've created in this country where we believe that we can transcend race the higher up the socioeconomic status we go. And that is your reality until it's not your reality anymore, right? Until you're profiled by a policeman, even if you are a millionaire, because you happen to be a black man, or maybe whatever the resources are that are available to you because of your, what you have or have been exposed to are no longer available because of your color. Um, so I think they're completely interconnected. And I think that there's also an opportunity for us to relate that to folks maybe who are not of a community of color because it's a choice to decide to engage in a conversation on race. And I think that's, that's a disservice for us as a society because then we're not actually coming together to really find some type of a solution. I found that to be the case specifically, and this was around the time when Rachel and I decided to become partners on this project, which wasn't that long ago. I mean, we've been working together for a while, but I personally decided that this was the project that I wanted to see come to fruition and, and move so far into um, our mainstream media after the Trayvon Martin verdict, because I had, and this is just on a personal level, I had phone calls from friends who were mothers of young black boys who were in tears because they felt that, what can I do to save them? When am I going to tell them that they are not valued the same as everyone else because they look different? I'm on the board of the Harlem Boys and Girls Club and I called the executive director and I asked, you know, how are the kids doing because this is them? And he sent me an email with quotes from them and they're 12 and 14 and 16 years old. And the, the, um, the apathy the feeling that they were not surprised that this was their reality uh, sent shockwaves through me because I felt that it wasn't just an issue that the black community needed to deal with, it's an issue that the American community needed to deal with. So if this film brings that home in some way that we have to do something to stop it, it's an epidemic, um, then you know we can talk about class and socioeconomic status, but at the end of the day, it's about race. So thank you. I think um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, if we can do this quickly, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here. So go ahead, sir. Let's let's have just just make the questions succinct if we can. I'm sorry. No, okay. um, you can do that. I know you can do that. Uh, my question is, um, you you talked earlier about the imagery of uh, of um, black people, uh, particularly being that this is a film about race. So I guess one of the things that I wanted to sort of talk about, because I'm in education, I think when you look at the over, uh, the, or the misrepresentation and the overrepresentation of black boys in special education as a um, um, school to prison pipeline, I also work in the DYS department, which is the Department of Youth Services, the Juvenile Justice uh, Education Wing in Massachusetts. And we have over 60% of students who are black and Latino in special education. And of the 13 categories of disability, the majority of those black boys are classified in a very subjective manner, such as emotional disturbance or mental retardation. So I think in terms of how do we bring the conversation, um, you know, to the, I think part of it is a conversation but I'm wondering the other part of it, how do we do it through media, the social media? Because I think that particularly our youth today are really into social media. Uh, so I guess I'm asking you, how do we begin to actually bring this conversation um, to a wider audience, get the young people, just like in, during the civil rights movement, they were mobilized, they were excited, they had, in many ways, the least to, uh, 
to lose in the whole um, the war. Um, how do we actually um, bring get them involved so that we can promote legislation? Well, first of all, it's thrilling and exciting that you're working uh, on these issues in education and on the ground. So, you know, my hat is off to you, and probably many other people in this room are are very engaged and involved in in, uh, in all of this. Um, I think that we are. Uh, we are hoping to have all of you go home and get on social media tonight, get online and look at hatecrimesheartland.com and uh, you know, send us, send us messages and send messages out to your friends. We need your help to get this film out. And um, so we would love for you to uh, let people know that you've seen it, that you want to see it, um, that you want to come, you know, by the video. That that this is a message that you are hoping to help get out, and uh, you know, let your local PBS station know. Um, you know, call WGBH. Let them know that you would love for this film to be on the air. Um, I think that we are um, pretty challenged in our country in terms of uh, coming together about what is going to make the change? How are we gonna get enough people who are economically disadvantaged, economically, socially, sure. and educationally disadvantaged up to uh, be, able, be able to make it? And you know, that's really the challenge. I think that Andrea Lyon really says it when she says you know, it's Caucasians and Asians who are expected and anticipated to do well and others who are not. It's really, uh, I, th I think it's a gigantic challenge. And I toss the question a little bit to you, David. What do you think is going to make a difference here in education in Massachusetts? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, somebody back there thinks he has an answer. Let, let, let me, uh, I, I, I'm not sure, but what, what, I, what I do want to, and I don't want to be flip about this, but I do think that that's the point of the conversation we need to be having uh, through the social media about this film. We need to be able to raise the questions that the young man raised and, and have some kind of exchange, ongoing exchange. Um, you know, there's, there are lots of pieces to the answer. We do work on implicit bias, you know, so that there are lot, and it show, that shows up in lots of different ways. There, there are a lot of answers to that, but I don't want to dwell on it. I do want to point to what I think is the most profound comment in the film in terms of race. And it's when the white guy says, I think we're getting along pretty well, but a black person might have a different answer, or something to that effect. I told Rachel before that should be the lead of the film. <coughs> she didn't listen to me. She moved it up a little. But, uh, but that, that I, I, and I think we should reflect on that. Because I think that's actually a very hopeful comment. That, that, that he was able to recognize that things were pretty good, but that there's a different perspective out there. And I think when we ask this question about the kind of narrowness of what we look at on the news and what have you, I think it takes away our ability to do that a little bit. So I give him a lot of credit, and I give you a lot of credit for, having, for, you know, for getting him to say that on camera. So um, I do want to say, I, I think we need to wrap this up, and I, and I, and I really apologize. Did you have an answer on the education question? No, OK. I just wanted to say one thing about the social media platforms. We're building them for you. Right, exactly. It is not for us to tell you what to say. It is not for us to wait for one leader to come and, and bring us down the road. This is really about right. engaging right. Right. grassroots to grass tops, multi-generations and ethnicities. So come and join the conversation and tell us and connect with someone who maybe you think is different from you but right. may have the same feeling about reconciliation. So I hope to see you all on Facebook and Twitter and make us a million instead of 400,000. <laughs> All right, thank so you So with that, I want, to, I want to, one last plug for Rachel. Uh, one last plug to the, is the young filmmaker still here? Yes. So uh, I want you to know that uh, what Rachel said to you is exactly what she does today still. That she uh, went around with getting, collecting film, you know, strong-arming Ogletree into making sure he'd sit down for a few minutes to interview, <laughs> collecting the footage, right? I mean, and, and, that, and, and what she said to you is exactly what she did in this film, right? 
When she, got, she, she shot when she could. She shot and shot and shot and put it together through a labor of love. So having said that, I also ask to make an announcement that tonight on POV, uh, the P um, P point of view, the film series, uh, Ghosts of Mississippi, it's not POV? It's uh, actually Independent Lens. But oh, it's Independent Lens, okay. Uh, no. It's part of the POV series. Okay, right, no, that's what, that's what I'm saying, right. So, uh, Ghosts of Mississippi. Ghosts of Mississippi. Ghosts of Mississippi apparently is uh, along these lines and you should enjoy it. So, again, let's give a, a hand to, to the producers of this film.